Okay, so <coughs> we have just finished the uh, Arya Paryasana Sutta, the Sutta on the Noble Search. And now we're going to carry on with the idea of right view. Uh, and this is a Sutta coming up now, which is much less known probably uh, to people in general. It's kind of hidden away in a work called the Sutta Nipata, which means like... Uh, collection of suttas or something like that. It's a little bit hard to make out exactly what it means. Uh, something like collection of suttas. Uh, and this is part of the uh, Kuddhaka Nikaya. Uh, Kuddhaka means like uh, short or minor, uh, and it happens to be the longest of all the collections, which is kind of a bit ironic, uh, but uh, there you are. Uh, and in the, uh, the Sutta Nipata is uh, made up of five chapters. Uh, the two last chapters are the chapters on eight, of the eights in a chapter on the going beyond the Parayana Vaga and the Attaka Vaga. And these are very ancient uh, poems. It's all, it's all poetry in this collection, uh, and often quite inspiring poetry. Uh, and these are very ancient, and they are found in Chinese translation and uh, other places. Uh, so they kind of go back a long, long way in uh, Buddhist history and <laughs> are referred to elsewhere in the suttas. Uh, Sometimes a cryptic verse is brought up by a monk and they will ask uh, the Buddha, what does this mean? Uh, and those cryptic verses often come from this collection because they, they can be a bit uh, profound. Yeah? The thing about verse, verse is supposed to inspire, verse is supposed to kind of uplift the mind uh, to make you, you know, feel, uh, feel the Dhamma rather than um, intellectually grasp the Dhamma. That's kind of the idea of verse. Uh, so it's supposed to be inspiring. Yeah? And for that reason, if you really want to understand the Dhamma, just understand the teachings, uh, you're better off reading the prose passages. Uh, but if you want to be inspired, then the verse can often be very inspiring. Yeah. And I would recommend any of you who are serious about Dhamma to have check out the Dhammapada. Uh, Dhammapada is a beautiful collection of verses. Yeah. And um, lots of the very famous verses, we'll see some of them later on, uh, that are often uh, kind of spoken about in Buddhist circles are found precisely in the Dhammapada. And there are some really nice translations available, uh, not least the one by Bhante Sudrata on Sutta Central, but there's a one by a fellow called Gil Fronsdal that is often uh, recommended, uh, and which I think also is quite nice. Uh, and uh, it's very, you know, you have that on your night table next to your bed, and you read a couple of verses and then before you sleep, and you sleep really nicely afterwards. Uh, that's kind of the idea of these uplifting verses. So. Anyway, so this particular sutta is from the Attakavaka, the chapter of eights in the Sutta Nipata. And it is sutta number, what is it again? 15. And uh, the Pali name for the sutta is Attadanda Sutta, which means something like taking up punishment. The danda literally means stick. Yeah? Taking up punishment, taking up a stick, taking up arms. <coughs> something to that effect. Uh, and uh, this sutta is also about the Buddha prior to his awakening, yeah, the Buddha to be, uh, and how he came to go forth. Yeah, what was, again, what motivated him, uh, what gave him the sense of urgency that he needed to get going uh, and uh, find a solution to the problems of life. Uh, so that is uh, where all of this uh, kind of comes in there. Uh, so again, we're still dealing with the Buddha struggling to find his way out of samsaric existence and all the problems of life. So um, here we go. So I'll, uh, maybe what I'll do, I'll read out the whole uh, poem first of all, and we can actually, this is not the whole poem, it's only a short part of it, it goes on much longer. But this is the part which has to do with right view. And then after right view comes the idea of the path of practice, and then comes the idea of the arahant, the, the uh, fully awakened one at the end. But I'm just looking at the right view part of this sutta. So this is how it goes. Peril stems from those who take up arms. Just look at people in conflict. I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency here. I saw this population flounder uh, like a fish in a little puddle. Uh. Seeing them fight each other, fear came upon me. Uh. The world around was hollow, all directions were in turmoil. Uh. Wanting a home for myself, uh, I saw nowhere unsettled. Yet even in their settlement they fight, uh, seeing that I grew uneasy. Uh. When I saw, then I saw a dart there, so hard to see stuck in the heart. 
When stuck by that dart, you run around in all directions. Uh, but when that same dart has been plucked out, uh, you neither run around uh, nor sink down. So, um, this is obviously about the, uh, the problems of samsaric existence, uh, how easily there is conflict and problems in the world, uh, yeah, and, and the kind of the danger and how it is basically you cannot escape from these things uh, in the ordinary world. Uh, this is kind of what this comes down to. Uh, and it starts off with peril stems uh, from those who take up arms. Uh, just look at people in conflict. Uh, yeah, the conflicts around the world and how conflict is kind of unavoidable in society and how it leads to all kind of violence and problems as a consequence of that. Uh, and um, uh, so he basically is just looking at the world and this is what he, what he sees. Uh, and then he says, I shall extol how I came to be stirred with a sense of urgency. Yeah, this feeling of conflict in the world uh, drives this sense of urgency. Now is the opportunity. Now is the chance. You're going to do something. Uh, and if you don't do something, you're going to get reborn back into the same problems again, uh, going around and around and around. Uh, I saw this population flounder uh, like a fish in a little puddle. Uh, yeah, the idea of floundering here is the idea of you can imagine a fish in a small puddle uh, is thrashing about, uh, trying to find this, an escape from this puddle. Uh, there is no escape. Uh, it is like it is doomed in this little puddle, trying to uh, find a way out. Uh, yeah? So you saw the population flounder like a fish in the puddle. To me, I don't know exactly how or if there is one right interpretation, but to me this means like the world is actually a small place. Uh, the world, there isn't anywhere to go in the world. There is no, you can travel to, you know, I don't know where you want to travel to, China or to, uh, you know, to North America or South America, or to Africa or wherever. It's all basically, basically the same. It's like a small place. It's small because the, the, there aren't really any places that are different. They're all the same because in the end we're all human beings. Uh, and human beings have the same problems. Uh, that's why when you read in the... Uh, whatever you read in the papers or the news around the world, uh, all societies tend to be beset by similar kind of problems. Uh, everyone wants the economy to grow, everyone has problems between rich and poor, uh, everyone has problems with violence and crime in the society, and there's always a kind of a, 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 kind of a, a standoff between the police and, and others, and uh, trying to control society, there's anarchy, and then there's the kind of the opposite, trying to control things. Uh, and it's just impossible to get this right. Uh, and that's kind of the point. It is impossible. Uh, that is the point of this. Uh, this population floundered because you are in a little puddle. There is no escape in this world. If you want to find an escape, <coughs> the escape is found on the spiritual path. Uh, that is where the escape from this world is found. Not by traveling outwards in the world, uh, but by traveling inwards into the mind as deep as you possibly can go. Uh, that is where the escape is found. Uh, in the world, people are floundering. Uh, there's nowhere to go. Uh, and this is where that simile I mentioned the other day comes in, the simile of the piece of meat, uh, the birds. Did I mention that simile? I think I mentioned it the other day. Uh, yeah? And uh, where that comes in, yeah, that we are always fighting and competing in the world, uh, that there is no way out of that fighting and competition because we are uh, fighting over the same thing. Is uh, the world outside is the world we have in common, and because we have it in common, uh, we act, and we all want a larger share of that world, there is going to be conflict, there is going to be violence, it's just impossible to avoid that. Uh, that world is uh, fraught with problems, uh, and so you thrash about, you, uh, you uh, uh, flounder uh, like a fish in a small puddle. Uh. Fish in a small puddle is like doomed. Seeing them fight each other, uh, fear came upon me here, yeah. because uh, I guess the Buddha to be is realizing that actually there is no escape, yeah? that fighting yeah, uh, is, is endemic, yeah. it is part of nature, it is part of the way things are, yeah. and that is kind of the realization that dawns on you. Yeah. It is interesting how yeah, in the history of the world we always try to create utopias. Yeah. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? You see the, uh, and very often, whenever we try to create utopias in the world, we make things worse. Uh, yeah, we, kind of the communist utopia or socialist utopia. Uh, I don't know if capitalism is an utopia, I don't know, maybe it's a kind of utopia as well. Uh, 
that when we try to kind of create this pure society based on an idea, uh, uh, it always fails and it leads to disaster instead of anything positive. Uh, places like Cambodia is kind of a very obvious case. Uh, you know, the regime there based on the idea of uh, if we just purge the people who are problematic, then everything will be fine. Uh, but it's a misunderstanding of the nature of the world. Uh, the, it, utopias are impossible from a Buddhist point of view. You cannot have a utopia because things are impermanent. Things are, you cannot have a stable society in which things are, you know, always right, a stable kind of peace. This is impossible. And one of the things that undermines that sta stability are precisely the human defilements, because human defilements want more for themselves. And whenever someone wants more, they're going to fight for that, they're going to create conflict. Yeah, even like in the old Soviet Union, the people on the top were very well off. They were looked after, they had special things because they had the power to get that for themselves. And so they used that power. Why? Because of desire, because of delusion, because of these things. These things undermine any kind of stability you have. So if you have a democracy, you can imagine that that democracy will be overthrown eventually. It will not last forever. That's impossible. Nothing lasts forever. When you see kind of powerful individuals or corporations trying to muscle themselves in on the democratic process and taking over and trying to get more power, that's to be expected. Huh? Because that's exactly what the defilements of the mind do. Huh? And you cannot create a perfect society from a Buddhist point of view that will uh, withstand those forces of the mind. They are far more powerful because these are the root things that uh, kind of drive us, that make us be, make us who we are, and make us human beings. Uh, so and that's kind of... Uh, Unpleasant when you realize that, uh, because you realize there is no perfection in that society, in the world outside. Uh, there's always, you're always playing catch up. Uh, you're playing catch up with uh, uh, the forces that make things fall apart, uh, forces that actually destroy society. Uh, and you never, can never be on top of the situation. You're always slightly behind, uh, trying to kind of solve issues that are, in the end are insoluble, uh, unsolvable, or whatever. Um, so fear comes upon you. This is the Buddha to be, right? He becomes fearful because he realizes there is a problem here. Uh, what is the uh, baya? Is the word a baya means like fear? That's exactly, exactly right. Uh, so um, the world around was hollow. All directions were in turmoil. Uh, the world is hollow. This is this idea, again, that there is nothing to hold on to in the world. There is no self. There is nothing that is stable. There is nothing you can grasp onto. As soon as you start trying to hold on to anything in the world, that thing will shake, that thing will quiver, that thing will wriggle its way out of your grasp. You cannot hold on to things because they are inherently unreliable. I like the idea of trying to stand somewhere. Whenever you're trying to take a stand on something, the stand here is my kind of simile for attachment, yeah? Because when you're standing somewhere, you feel safe. Okay, I can stand here. The ground is safe. It is not a marsh or a kind of quicksand, but the ground is solid. It's granite, okay? I can rest. Of course, you can't rest. Whenever you take a stand, whenever you attach or you hold on to something or you rely on something, that is going to take and be taken away from you. It is as if everything is always quaking a little bit, like an earthquake going on. Sometimes it's a small quake, and other times it's a big quake. And when it's a big quake, you fall over because the uh, impermanence is so great. Uh, it's like when you die or something big happens in your life, uh, the big quake comes around. But it's always there, always shaking a little bit. Uh, and underneath the surface, the tensions are building up. You can't see them building up. Uh, just like in real life with these kind of fault lines, uh, the tension builds up and builds up until one day, bang, it releases its power. Uh, and it's like that in our lives. Uh, Tensions building up under the surface, and then bang, they come out into view. There's a war in Ukraine, there's whatever there is, uh, and there's this death in your, 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 in your body. Uh, your, your body dies because it's, uh, the cancer has been building up, or whatever it is, uh, and the forces are so strong. Uh, there's nothing to rely on, uh, nothing to hold on to, uh, and the impermanence is always there. And uh, you can see why uh, this gives rise to a sense of uh, urgency, right? A sense of fear, a sense of, actually, this is really dangerous. Uh, 
The world is completely out of control. The directions are in turmoil. There is nothing to hold on to in the world. The moment you hold on, you're asking for suffering. Are you asking for suffering? It's a good question, isn't it? There's a nice symbol in the suttas, which uh, I didn't really know how to interpret initially, but then I, I thought I realized the interpretation of this. I didn't bother to read the commentaries, maybe I should read the commentaries, but I didn't. Uh, and the commentaries, uh, uh, no, the, the sutta has a symbol of the grass torch. Uh, I've talked this many times before, I usually teach this every time I do a retreat, I haven't included it here. Uh, the symbol of the grass torch is uh, the symbol for sense pressures. Remember, the sense pressures is the world, that's what we're talking about here, really. It was always about the five senses, right? That's what the world is. Uh, this is what we're dealing with here. Huh? So the Buddha says it's like a grass torch. Uh, yeah, the five senses are like a grass torch. Uh, if you grab that grass torch uh, and you hold it up, but you hold it the wrong way, you hold it against the wind, uh, so the wind comes against you. Huh? Of course, the grass torch is full of embers. The embers are going to come off uh, and they're going to burn you. Huh? Right? Uh, so this is the way, that, this is the problem with the world and the five senses. We grasp onto things, we grasp onto these burning things. Uh, and then the embers come off and they burn you. And then you, either you have death-like suffering uh, or you actually die as a consequence. Uh, and what is that wrong way of grasping the grass? Uh, what is that? What does it refer to? Uh, well, it refers to, instead of just using the five senses for what they are, yeah, working, uh, and making sure that we function in the world, that we're able to do what we're supposed to do. Instead of doing that, like an arahant would do, maybe a street mantra would do, instead we grasp them tight as if we own them. And the moment you grasp anything tight as if you own it, at that moment you're asking for suffering. You're saying, please, may I suffer? Don't say, please, may I suffer? I recommend not to say that. <laughs> kind of obvious, the Buddha recommends that, right? Coming out of this... So this is, uh, this is the problem with this grass torch, the idea of grasping onto things in the world, uh, things that are ungraspable. Uh. There's another nice simile of the Buddha. He says that uh, the five senses or the desire for the objects of the five senses uh, is like uh, you're incurring a debt. Yeah? It's like incurring a debt when you enjoy those things. Uh. And the debt is exactly this. Uh, the moment you grasp, uh, the moment you hold on, uh, then at some point, you will be forced to let go, whether you want to or not. Uh, in fact, you can't let go, so the thing disappears, and then you grieve and you sorrow as a consequence. Uh, yeah, you incur a debt every time you grasp onto these things. Uh. So how do we overcome this attachment then? Uh? Because uh, I, sometimes I hear Buddhist people say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist, I shouldn't attach. Uh, right? I shouldn't attach. Is that really a solution? <laughs> I, I mean... Yes, maybe you shouldn't attach, but that is really not very helpful to say I shouldn't attach, because is it really possible to just detach? And the answer, of course, is no, you cannot do that. So the answer to detachment is that by practicing this path in the right way, by living well, by the simple fact of living with kindness, you are actually detaching it. If you have a good heart, why is that? Well, because if you have a good heart, you have to overcome those defilements that stop you from being kind. And that is a kind of detachment right there. Right? So just by practicing the path in the right way, being circumspect, being wise about how you live, learning to think in the right way, all of that actually leads to detachment automatically. There is more you can do, and that is what these symbols are about. What you can do in addition to that is to reflect on the danger of these things. And when you reflect on the danger, you will let go a little bit. Yeah, because you understand that it is a problem, and then it will be easier to, to live the noble eightfold path as a consequence. So that is really all you have to do. But don't say to yourself, I'm a bad Buddhist if I don't detach, because that's crazy. It cannot be done. Attachment is part of life. You have to attach. Whether you want to or not, you have no choice in the matter, at least to some extent. Why is that? This is kind of a very interesting point of Dhamma, why it is that attachments are necessary uh, and why they are part of life, just as craving and desires are part of life. Uh, why is that? Uh, and the answer is because of the sense of self. Uh, yeah, if, when there is a sense of self, uh, that sense of self has to have a certain content. Yeah, it has to be something that it relates to, otherwise you don't have a sense of self. It has to relate to something. Yeah. 
And the things that it relates to, obviously, are some of your inner states of mind. So the fact of consciousness that you are aware, that will be often be taken as a part of yourself. Your doing, yeah, your will, the volition within, that will be taken as part of who you who you think you take yourself to be, yeah, very because we take ourselves to be the doers. Uh, but uh, it is more than that, because consciousness in itself, just awareness, not really enough, you're also aware of things, uh, yeah. So the sense of self is not limited to your internal states of mind, but it leaches into the world, it goes into the world. Uh, because we like to do, the doing happens in the world, and because, because consciousness likes to experience, we like happy feelings. Uh, we want to control the world so we can experience those happy feelings. That's what the self wants, yeah? It wants to be happy. Yeah? And so we go, the sense of self leaches into the world. We start to try to control things around us. And this is where all this idea of ownership happens. Yeah, I want to own things because then I can control. Ownership implies control. That's the whole point of it. But it turns out you cannot actually own things in that way. So there is a conflict, a deep conflict between what the sense of self wants and the nature of the world. An irreconcilable conflict. And the only way to overcome that conflict is to give up the sense of self. And of course, that is one of the most delightful things that you can do ever, is to give up the sense of self. So as soon as there is a sense of self, there is attachment in the world. Yeah, these things belong together. They are two sides of the same coin. These are not uh, separable uh, in any at all. Uh. So attachment comes with that. Uh. And uh, so that, then all we can do, because we have the sense of self as a given, uh, all we can do is just change our attachments a little bit, reduce them a little bit, point them in a different direction. Uh. Attach to kindness, yeah? Okay, I'm a kind person. Identify with that uh, instead of identifying with something stupid, uh, yeah? Like uh, I am educated or wealthy or whatever, or whatever else it is that you, you identify with. Uh, yeah. Or nationality. National, people identify with the nationality in the world. Uh, that's how we get wars, right? Uh, I am this nationality. Yeah, I am better than you, or whatever. This is kind of how people tend to think. Yeah. And so we have wars in the world. We demonize the enemy. Yeah. And uh, so identify with kindness. I, one of, you know, one of those terrible things that was happening in Burma a few years ago, or still going on actually in Burma right now, was the problems with the Rohingyas, the Muslim uh, immigrants or the Muslim uh, 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 refugees. They're coming over the border, coming from Burma, coming in, uh, sorry, coming from Bangladesh into uh, Burma, and then you had this Buddhists, yeah, Buddhist monastics, uh, who were basically saying that these, you know, they were bad people or whatever, and they were really militant about this. Uh, and it was kind of painful to watch. It made you wonder, you know, are they Buddhists? What are they? What's going on here? How can a monk speak like this and kind of incite violence against a tiny minority that's obviously suffering enormously? Uh, and it, I don't know if you remember, but it made us, uh, because I, made its way on the front page of Time magazine. Time magazine is one of the largest magazines in the world with, a, I don't know, a, at least it was then, I'm not sure what it is now, a, a four million copies every week or something. And uh, they kind of had the Buddhist face of evil, yeah, I think was the cover of Time magazine. It had a picture of this monk, yeah, this Burmese monk who was kind of inciting violence against the, these Muslims. And uh, why does that happen? Well, it happens because we identify as Buddhists. Yeah? I am a Buddhist. These Muslim invaders, they are threatening Buddhism and because they are threatening Buddhism and this is my identity, I have to save Buddhism. That's kind of the idea. But that is really problematic and this is why we should avoid this kind of national identity or religious identity. Yeah? Identify with something. What we should instead identify with are principles to live by. So if you identify as a practicing Buddhist, then you are okay, because at that point you will be kind towards these Muslims, you will be kind towards these refugees, because you are identifying with the kindness, rather than identifying with the nationality or the religion or the group that you belong to. That's kind of a way of, we have to identify with something. This is a way of kind of elevating your identity to something higher, attaching to something more beautiful and more conducive to practicing the path. That is what we want to do. And then gradually, as we do this, we kind of go up the ladder of attachment. Attachment to fine, finer and finer things. 
As you do this, you get into meditation practice. Uh, you attach a little bit to meditation. Uh, please attach to, to virtue and meditation. Right? It's okay. It is not bad. People say you shouldn't attach to this. You should attach to these things. Uh, because if you don't attach to those things, uh, you can attach to bad things instead. Uh, <laughs> it's true, right? Because we have to attach. That's the whole point. Uh, so because we have to attach, please attach to these good things. Uh, people who say you should attach to virtue have lost plot. They don't know what they're talking about. The reason they say that, you really, is because if you look at the, there is something called you know, like, like the three fetters, you know, the three things we have to abandon to become a stream mentor. And one of those fetters is called sila bhatta paramasa, which means holding on to sila. Sila is virtue. Yeah? So they say, okay, the stream mentor, to become a stream mentor, you have to give up this fetter. Yeah? So it means that I should not attach to virtue. Yeah? I should, that's kind of, sila bhatta bhatta is like a observances or you know something like that the kind of things you do basically yeah. and um, but uh, it doesn't mean that this this is not the path to getting to stream entry this is the result of becoming a stream entry yeah. when you become a stream entry it is a something that happens in your mind that you no longer attach to virtue and the reason that you no longer attach to virtue is because it becomes part of you yeah. Yeah, it becomes so deeply embedded in you psychologically yeah, that you cannot avoid being virtuous anymore. You have to be virtuous. Yeah. And that's why you don't attach to it, because it's part of who you are. Yeah. But before you become a stream actor, you better attach to that virtue a little bit. Yeah. If you don't, you are not going to keep your precepts, you're not going to live with kindness. Yeah. Yeah, you have to understand the importance of these things, yeah. otherwise it's not going to work. Yeah. And uh, by attachment, I just mean, you know, that determination, that uh, desire to be, to, to be kind, yeah? to be nice, not to be a nasty character. <laughs> That's really what it means. Uh, yeah? That is a little bit of attachment, a little bit of holding on. So please hold on a little bit to these things. Uh. And then comes the meditation practice. And this is also very interesting because then you go even higher again, right? Especially when you start to get into samadhi uh, and people tell you, oh, don't go to samadhi because you get attached uh. No, that's good to be attached to samadhi, because these are precisely the higher attachments. Uh, if you don't attach to samadhi, you can attach to something else, which is lower. Uh, what do you want to attach to, the higher or the lower? Attach to the higher. Right? So this is the right way of thinking about this. And then when you are attached to samadhi, but then you learn how to deal with that in such a way that you can go beyond. You learn to have insights, you go to even higher states of samadhi, and then you transcend it. But a, a degree of holding on to samadhi is actually good. There is a very nice um, saying in the uh, Pasadika Sutta, which is the uh, long discourse, the Buddha number 29, uh, uh, which is something uh, like uh, uh, by attaching the power, is the Pali word again uh, there, Anuyutta or something like that? Uh, by attach, which means basically holding on or attaching. Uh, by attaching to four things, uh, yeah, you become a uh, no, sorry, by attaching to the four jhanas, you can expect only four results. Uh, what are those four results? Uh, stream entry, once returning, non returning, and arahanship. The four stages of awakening you get by holding on a little bit to those jhanas. Uh, so, yeah, we, because of the sense of self, uh, some degree of attachment is required. So, just make sure you attach to the right thing. This is the idea here kind of a ladder of attachment. Uh, and the same is really true for desires as well. You have to have some degree of desire. It's impossible to live without desires completely. Yeah. So again, you, you ennoble those desires. You ennoble your attachments. Uh, and this way, you go up this path. Uh. So, yeah, all directions are in turmoil. Yeah, because everything is impermanent. Everything is unreliable. And the Buddha says, wanting a home for myself... Uh, I saw nowhere unsettled there. Yeah, the idea unsettled here apparently means something like unsettled by impermanence or unreliability. Yeah. So you're looking for a home. Yeah, we all want a home for ourselves because a home is where we can relax, we can enjoy. A home is where we are safe, right? That's the idea. But actually, you're not really safe in that home. That's the problem. That's what people are saying here. Yeah. 
So that's what the idea of a home, a place where you can withdraw from the world. You can enjoy some nice food, you have a nice kitchen there, you have nice company with your friends and your family, you have some entertainment and all these kind of things. Yeah, you're protected from the rain and the elements. So a home is a very important thing and people have always had homes, it seems, throughout human history of some kind or another. But it is not as safe as you think. Yeah, and uh, I kind of... In Australia, we have all of these um, natural disasters like fires, and not a few years ago we had a fire coming through very close to our monastery, uh, and one of the little villages nearby burnt down. The whole village is kind of gone, basically. Uh, and uh, you can see people grieve. Yeah, they really, really grieve uh, because their, this is their home. All their belongings were in that house. Everything they owned. <laughs> Suddenly, all they have is the clothes they're wearing. Everything else is gone. Uh, and people are really, really distraught. Uh, <coughs> This was my safety. This was where everything that mattered to me was, and now it's all gone. So we're looking for a home, but those homes are not real. And that is where the Buddha says, find the refuge within. The refuge, the real home, is actually inside. And there's a beautiful saying by Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Brahm's teacher, that you find the, uh, uh, the real home is the samadhi inside. Yeah, that is your real home, because there you really are safe, because your inner life, if you are able to develop samadhi, and you're able to take refuge in that, of course, that no one else is able to, that is not touched by the outer world, because precisely it is beyond the outer world. You have left the world behind, you've gone to the end of the world. That is what it says in the suttas, they said that the jhanas are the end of the world. The end of which world? The end of the world of the five senses. So that's kind of a nice way of thinking about these uh, samadhi states, the end of the world. You, the world can no longer touch you. That is your real home. That is where you can find safety. Uh, that is where you can finally relax a little bit uh, until you have to come out of that jhana state and then the relaxation is over, unfortunately. Uh, then that's why you have to become an arahant and get out of this mess once and for all. So, uh, no home for yourself. Yeah, that is kind of problematic. And uh, then he says, uh, yet even in the settlement they fight, even if you do find the so-called home for yourself, uh, you keep on fighting. Yeah, yeah you, sometimes we fight within our families. Uh, that is kind of a bit... It's a tragic that we kind of fight within our families, right? It's kind of because that is supposed to be our refuge in the world. So making a lot of effort to having a good family life, I think, is so important. Because then, even if the world outside is rough, which it often is, yeah, you go to work and it's difficult and it's hard, at least you have one place where you can feel relaxed, where you can feel at ease. You have a a good partner in life, if you have children, you have a good relationship with them, you put a lot of effort into making that right. Uh, because if that is right, at least you have some kind of refuge. But for many people, uh, home life is actually uh, difficult and bad and terrible and uh, full of all kinds of things. And that is, uh, that is really problematic. Uh, um, and then you have to kind of go to the pub, yeah, to kind of get away from your house, right? People do that, right? Oh, I'm really glad to get out of the house and go out to the pub. And then you drink instead. Great, really good solution to, <laughs> to, <laughs> to the problem. And so this is how, how it goes. Uh, one of the greatest things, I think, in my life is the, uh, giving up alcohol, I think, is one of the kind of really great benefits in life. Yeah, this kind of... It's, I don't know about you, maybe sometimes it's difficult because of your social life, you think you have to drink, but actually not drinking is such a wonderful thing. Yeah? It's like clears the mind and it kind of, uh, I don't know, I, I, after a while you wonder how I could ever drink again. It seems like such a crazy thing to do when you gain that degree of clarity. Yeah? And, uh, but that's what people do when they suffer. Yeah? Yeah, it comes from suffering. Yeah? You suffer, so you drink, yeah? and uh, it makes things worse. Anyway, so in the settlement of fight, seeing that I grew uneasy, and the Pali word for uneasy is arati, I think. Let me just check it out, because I have the Pali right here. And just to make sure, I just prove to you I do my homework, I don't mess around. Arati is the word, and arati means like discontent. Yeah, you grow discontent with the world. You don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. You've had enough of the world. And um, so the Buddha has seen 
the problem in the world. Yeah, this is an other problem. Before we focused on the personal problems. I am going, growing old. I am getting sick. I am. I will have to die. I will have to sorrow. Yeah, and it was more personal. Here it is more about the nature of the world in general. Uh, that there is no refuge, there is no place to go. Uh, and then you get fed up with that. And once you have seen the problem, well then you look for the cause of the problem. Uh, everything in the Dhamma is looking for causes. Yeah, Because everything is conditioned one way or another. Always about causes. Uh, so this is the next thing he does, uh, the Buddha to be. Uh, and then he says, I saw a dart there, uh, so hard to see stuck in the heart. And the dart, of course, in Buddhism is craving. Yeah? Craving is the, is the dart in the heart. Yeah? The dart in the heart, that's nice. <laughs> uh, because uh, it is like a pain inside of us. Uh, yeah? It is this thing that makes you run around all the time. The things that doesn't allow you any rest. Uh, and it actually is a painful thing to have craving. Yeah? And often we don't realize how painful it is, uh, this dart in the heart. Um, and the reason we don't realize how, how uh, painful it is, because we don't, first of all, we don't really know the alternative. We've never really been fully peaceful. If you get incredibly restless, you know kind of how painful craving is. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we don't. And the second reason is because we identify with craving. Yeah? Because you identify with the doer, I want to do, I want to express my sense of individuality by doing. Yeah? This is how we think, yeah? because this, that is how we think, and because we are. Uh, intoxicated by the idea of doing, yeah, and we want to do, craving becomes our friend, because craving is what drives the doing. Yeah. So you actually identify with craving itself. Yeah. Yeah, and this is why it is very difficult to see these things, yeah, because they are very counter to uh, some of the kind of uh, the delusions that we buy into, and the delusion of self is so powerful that, that we, it's impossible to see these things clearly, really. But the Buddha sees it, and this is the Buddha to be sees it, and this, of course, is the Buddha, the power of the Buddha, seeing these things. <laughs> so he saw the dart right there, stuck in the heart, right? Uh, you can feel the craving, and uh, you can kind of feel it maybe in the heart area sometimes. Uh, um, uh, when stuck by that dart, you run around in all directions, yeah? Craving makes you run around. Craving is uh, tanhadasa, you are a slave to craving, as it says in that beautiful sutta, the uh, Ratapala Sutta, middle length sayings of the Buddha number 82. Check it out, it's a really beautiful sutta, and I often read it out on these retreats. And uh, one of the things it says there, you are a slave to craving. Yeah? You think that craving is your friend, but actually no, craving is uh, carrying the whip and whipping you over the back yeah, and making you run around and saying, do this, do that, yeah, work harder. And you say, yes, master, yeah, and you're very happy to follow the dictates of the craving, yeah. Craving is in charge, you are the little slave. <laughs> it is, and it's so hard to see, right, it, because it doesn't feel like that. It feels the other way around, uh, but actually it is not. Uh, until you enter a state of full peace, and then you understand why craving is so problematic. Yeah. So Tanahadasa, the slave to craving, is one of those many of those beautiful little phrases that you find in the suttas. Yeah. How does that go again? That's actually a nice one. I'll tell you that uh, story from that sutta. I don't know if I have time because uh, we have too many suttas. Anyway, I'll just tell it anyway because uh, I don't... I was going to say I don't care, but I, I care actually. <laughs> but um, this is a story, a famous story of this uh, young man uh, yeah, who wants to become a monk. And many of you will have heard this story before because it's quite famous. And, and he becomes the uh, person with the greatest faith. Yeah, the, in the Anguttara Nikaya ones, you have like the preeminent disciple in wisdom, the preeminent disciple in psychic powers, and then you have the preeminent disciple in, in faith. And this happens to be this young person. His name is Ratapala. And uh, so uh, he, uh, the Buddha comes to his little town where he's staying, it's called Tulakotita, this is the name of the town. It's kind of a very obscure place, only mentioned once, uh, probably very small. And so he goes to listen to the Buddha. Uh, and after the Buddha has given the sermon, he knows this is it, I have found exactly what I want to do. His confidence is absolutely firm. Uh, so he goes up to the Buddha and says, can I please ordain? Uh, and the Buddha says, well, actually, you need the permission from your parents. Have you got permission from your parents? Uh, he says, no, but I will make sure I get permission from my parents. Uh, 
he is really determined, right? There's, there's nothing is going to stop him from ordaining. So he goes back to his parents, and predictably enough, his parents say, no way you're going to ordain, absolutely no chance in the world. You are our only child, you are the inheritor, and you are the one who's going to inherit all our wealth. It's a very wealthy family, very, you know, very important family in that little town. You're going to stay put, you're going to kind of be here. And he says, okay, in that case, I will lie down on the ground, and I will die right here. That's what he says, right? So he lies down on the ground, stops eating, nothing, he just lies right there. And after a few days, his parents start to get a bit nervous. Yeah, is he serious? What's going on here? So they start kind of trying to persuade him and then say, oh, you know, you know, why don't you get up and enjoy yourself? You can make merit, right? This is one of those things that you see. They bring in his friends and the friends try to persuade him. And then after a while, his friends realize, actually, this fellow, he's really serious about this. And so they go to the parents and say, well, if you allow him to go forth, yeah, at least you can allow him to go forth on the condition that he comes back and visits you, right, after he's gone forth. And so eventually they relent because they realize he's going to die, yeah, he's really serious. So they relent and said, okay, you can't go forth, but you have to come back and visit us. Okay, I'll come back and visit you. So he goes to the Buddha, he ordains, he becomes an arahant, then he goes back and visits the parents. Now, if your son is an arahant, things are a little bit different, right? They're not the way they were before. Things have changed a little bit. The relationship with parent and child is not what it used to be. <laughs> so he comes back, and there's this great story, right? When he comes back to his parents, and they, they want him to return to lay life, yeah? So they kind of, they invite him, oh, please come for a meal. It's like this long story, but they invite him for a meal, and his... And his parents had put up these huge piles of gold, right? One pile of gold and one another card of gold over here. They put a chair in the middle uh, and put up a screen. And behind the screen, they put up his ex-old wife, right? And they kind of make her up to look super duper beautiful, right? And they're going to pull back the screen when he comes, right? This is your gold, the gold and your wife. Everything is ready for you. Uh, and then he, uh, <laughs> he comes into the house, right? And he... Uh, he, uh, first of all, he addresses his wife, who's really made her probably super beautiful. He addresses her as sister, right? Uh, so she faints, right, on the spot, because what sister? Uh, so that, that, getting that, that got his wife out of the way. And then, uh, <laughs> and then he, uh, he says, his dad says, oh, this is your gold, yeah, your inheritance from your father, this is from your mother's side, uh, yeah. And then Rotapala, this young this, uh, monk, he, he says to his dad, he says, householder, uh, <laughs> Imagine being the dad and your son calls you householder. It's like, what, what is going on here? And uh, I never said that to my father. I was glad, I'm glad I didn't do that. And uh, then he says, well, householder, says, if, if you wouldn't get upset, I will tell you what to do with all this gold. Yeah, and the father says, yeah, whatever, tell, say. <laughs> yeah, he's not too pleased. And so I said, well, if I were you, I would take all this gold, I would get some big sacks, yeah, put all the gold into those big sacks, load the sacks onto carts, have the carts driven into the middle of the Ganges, chuck it all out into the river Ganges. That's what I would do if I were you. Why? Because there's all this gold and stuff, it's going to cause you so much trouble in the future. His father is not amused. <laughs> so that is the story, and it's kind of it's interesting because it's uh, it sounds a bit harsh for these poor parents, uh, and maybe he should have been a bit more sensitive. I don't know if arahants are so so insensitive always, but uh, it's interesting. It's the idea of the story, I think, is just to show the contrast yeah, between uh, how ordinary people live and 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 then an, an arahant lives. Uh, that's just the introduction to the real part of the sutta, because then after seeing his parents, he goes off to the park nearby, and there he meets the local king, and the local king is uh, really interested in Buddhism. Yeah? So they have a chat between Ratapala the monk and the king, and the king Koravya is his name. And so the king Koravya comes there, and he, he kind of sits down, and he asks Ratapala, he says, Master Ratapala, Venom Ratapala, you are young. You come from a wealthy family. Uh, you have all of these relations. Uh, you have everything to live for. Uh, why on earth uh, did you go forth? Uh, are you nuts? No, he didn't ask that. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was adding that. So, uh, 
Why it's a, good, it's a very good question, right? It's the kind of question that we should all ask. How come someone who is young, successful, has got everything to live for in life, still they go forth? What is going on there? And then he says, there are these four summaries of the Dhamma that I heard from the Buddha. And when I heard those four summaries of the Dhamma, I decided to go forth. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure if I can remember all four now. I'm not going to try, because if I do, I'm going to mess it up, and that would be too embarrassing for me. Yeah. So, <laughs> But one of those summaries of the Dhamma is the summary that uh, the world is insatiate. Uh, yeah? it's, the world is insatiate, the slave of craving, uh, and some other word. Uh, what is it again now? The world is, uh, it basically that's what it is, yeah? insatiate and a slave to craving. Yeah? And uh, the king says to Ratapala, what does this mean? I don't understand. The world is insatiate, the slave to craving. And the Ratapala says to him, he says, well, if you... Uh, have, you know, you are, you have a big army, you have horses and all of these kind of things. And if a man comes to you, a trustworthy man who you have sent ahead, he comes to you and says, well, in the Western direction, there is a kingdom full of elephants and horses and wealth and all kinds of things. But your army is more powerful. Okay, great king, would you conquer that land? And the king says, of course I would conquer that land, as if it was absolutely obvious. Another man comes from the south, comes from the east, comes from the north with the same message. There is a land there which is full of all of these riches and wealth, but your army is stronger, would you conquer it? Of course I would conquer it. There's another land overseas, would you conquer it? Of course you would. And you can imagine this going on forever, right? There obviously is no limit to the design. After you have conquered the whole earth, you would probably want to go for the solar system and then to go for the galaxy. And then when they come to the galaxy, you would go for the non-universe. And I reckon this is why in physics they invented this idea of multiverses, because craving was not satisfied with one universe. <laughs> right? That's what I reckon. That's what I reckon is the cause of this multiverse theory. There's no other logical reason for it. Anyway. <laughs> so, and that is the idea of being a slave to craving. That idea of being insatiate. There is no satisfaction in that world. So if you want to be satisfied, you have to go in a different direction. And that is the spiritual path. And this is really so what this is about. And that, this is why, of course, Ratapala went forth. Even though he was wealthy, he realized actually it doesn't give satisfaction here. So um, you are stuck by that dog. You run around in all directions, driven by craving. Right? There's no end to that craving. There's always more to be had. But when that same dart has been plucked out, when you eliminate that craving, yeah, you neither run around nor sink down. You stop running around, but that doesn't mean you become depressed. People might think that if you take out craving, it sounds depressing, because what are you going to do if there's nothing to drive you on in the world? But of course, that's missing the point, because taking out craving, if you do that by following the Noble Eightfold Path, you get enormous amounts of happiness at the same time. So it's actually extremely satisfying. So you don't sink down. In fact, you are lifted up, elevated. It's like you become filled with helium and you float up in the world. That's kind of the idea of giving up that dart. So this is the Buddha, yeah? the Buddha to be, seeing the problem in the world. You can see he sees the problem in the world from many different angles here. Now it's more like a kind of panoramic view of the problem in the world. And there is a beautiful perception in the suttas. The Buddha often talks about developing certain perceptions. And this perception is called the Sabba Loki Anabirati Sanya. And it means the perception of non-delight in the whole world. Sabba Loka Anabirati Sanya. And this is what this is about. Yes? Seeing the whole world as really not worthy of our involvement. Yeah, it's actually not all that interesting. So you reject the whole gamut, the whole thing, the whole world is rejected in one go. That is quite a nice way of contemplating it. And right now, when the world is going through so many problems, yeah, and people around the world are getting depressed and sad because there's COVID, there's climate change, there's wars, there's the big powers are saber-rattling saber with each other, and there's all these things going on. It seems terrible. But no, it is an opportunity, and that's the whole point. It's an opportunity for right view. It actually, if you use this wisely, it's a wonderful opportunity to reject all of that stuff because you know it is unsatisfactory, it is bad, it is pointless, it is always going to lead to trouble, it is unreliable. 
And then you reject that world and all those problems and you turn in a different direction, which is far more conducive to happiness. So seeing the problems in the world and dealing with them in the right way actually leads you out of the problem rather than into the problem. That is such a beautiful way of thinking about the problems in the world because it gives you hope. It gives you a feeling that actually, no, there is a way out. It's just in a very different direction from what you thought. It's a beautiful message from Buddhism. And this is a kind of message that we can really deliver to the world. There is an alternative. You're just looking in the wrong place. That is the problem. Sampa Loke Anabirati Sanya found in a number of places in the suttas. I really like that idea of uh, kind of rejecting the whole world. Uh. So the Buddha sees the problem, uh, the dukkha, then he sees the cause of the problem, which is the dart in the heart, the craving. Uh. And then he sees the solution, which is the removal of that dart. Yeah? So these are the three kind of right views that arise at this particular point. Uh. The path comes next. I haven't actually included that uh, because uh, uh, just too many verses, I thought. it. So uh, that is not part of this here, but we, of course we're talking about the path all the time anyway. Yeah. So uh, there you are. That is the sutta of taking up arms. And um, yeah, so uh, again, just about a right view, really. And this is what this uh, is about. So we have a bit more time. Uh, I think these sessions are supposed to last an hour and a quarter, so until five o'clock. So we're gonna, I might as well start going on to the next sutta. Are you ready for that? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm amazed. You are really keen, that's wonderful. I'm really happy about that actually. So, uh, so now we have looked at the kind of personal problems, yeah, a right view, it's seeing, understanding yourself in the right way. We've looked at the world in general from a point of right view. And now we're going to look at uh, these things that give rise to joy in meditation. And these are also, in a sense, based on right view, right? Understanding the world in the right way. And there are six ways mentioned in the suttas uh, that uh, anusat is recollections that you use for giving rise to joy. And these are the six mentioned in the sutta. Uh, Mahanama Sutta in the numerical discourses. Uh, let's see if I have included everything I have. Okay, so these six ways are recollection of the Buddha, yeah, recalling the Buddha in the right way. That relies on right view because it relies on seeing the Buddha in the right way, who he was, understanding his his pers personality, if you like. Recollecting the Dhamma, understanding what these teachings are really are about. Recollecting the Sangha means the noble people, understanding what they are, those who understand these teachings. Recollection of uh, your sila, yeah, your, uh, your uh, morality or your kindness. Recollection of generosity. And the last one, recollection of the devas, the devatas. All of these have to do with right view in one way or another. And that may not be obvious to you. Huh? But, uh, it, it, but if you think about it a little bit, you will see why that has to be the case. If you look at the standard definition of right view, there's two kind of ways that right view is normally defined in the suttas. One way is understanding the Four Noble Truths, right? That is a really profound way of thinking about the right view. But then there's an alternative one, which is more the ordinary kind of right view. And that is the one where you it talks about uh, there is what is given, what is sacrificed, what is offered. Uh, yeah? There's mother and father, the results and fruits of, of a good and bad actions. Uh, there is uh, spontaneously arisen beings. Uh, there, uh, there are people in the world who have practiced well and who have gone well, uh, who have realized this world and the other. Uh, Right? So this idea of right view, right there, there are people who have realized this world and other in the other world, itta loka, para loka. And um, so uh, that is what the Buddha is. He is one of these people who has realized this. So that is part of right view. If you don't think the Buddha has, has any special insight, you're not going to be a Buddhist. What's the point? If the Buddha is just another fellow walking around, that's kind of no point. But if the Buddha is someone special, of course, then this starts to make sense. So it's part of right view. So um, I want to start out by talking about the Buddha a little bit uh, and trying to understand who the Buddha was, uh, how to relate to him as a person. Uh. So 
To do this, I will just uh, read what is here, and then I will just comment, as I usually do, uh, in my own little way. So, uh, this is uh, AN 6.10, and AN means the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses. Uh, the 6 means the 6th chapter, the chapter of 6s, that has 6 items in each, in each sutta. This is the 10th sutta, with Mahanama. Mahanama uh, the Sakyan, he was a cousin of the Buddha, and he was a layperson. He was the brother of Anuruddha. And, uh, and uh, one of the nice stories in the Vinaya Pitaka, which I have translated actually, uh, is the story of Mahanama and Anuruddha, and how it came about that Anuruddha became a monk and Mahanama stayed as a layperson. Do you know that story? I've told it in a few places, but uh, I'll tell it again. It's a nice kind of, it's a nice little story here. So this is the uh, Buddha coming back to the Sankhya. The Sankhya is his family clan, right? Large kind of family clan. Uh, and uh, so uh, they had the capital city or capital town or capital village, whatever it was, uh, called uh, Kapilavattu. And you can go to Kapilavattu in the present day and you can see it. Uh, there were some seals found in that place, which has Kapilavattu written on them. Uh, this is in India. This, uh, there's a big argument about where Kapilavattu actually was. And the Nepalese wanted to have it in Nepal, and the Indians wanted to have it in India. Uh, and they were fighting over who has Kapilavattu. And the reason they're fighting is because lots of money to be had yeah, by having Kapilavattu on your territory, uh, especially for the Nepalese. Uh, Nepalese is a small country, uh, yeah, tourism is very important, uh, and so they wanted to have it. So there was a lot of argument, but the one in India has a much better pedigree because they found seals buried in the ground, uh, lots of them, uh, with the inscription Kapilavattu. So it seems pretty, I don't know, dry, cut and dry that that actually was the real thing. Uh. But uh, anyway, so the Buddha, after his awakening, he goes back to Kapilavastu, or Kapilavattu, and uh, he gives talks, yeah, and many of his family members, his larger family, they decide to become monastics. Yeah? And then they have a discussion in the family of Mahanama and Arudha. Yeah? And they say to each other, yeah, you know, everyone is going forth these days, becoming monks and nuns, presumably as well, maybe, already, which that was established. Uh, we too, at least one of us should go forth. We can't both go forth, but one of us should go forth. Uh, which one should it be? So Mahanama said, well, what, what do you think? And Anuruddha said, well, you know, I have been brought up in such incredible comfort. I'm so spoiled, right? So utterly spoiled. There's no way I can deal with monastic life. So you go forth. Uh. <laughs> and there's a famous story of the nutty cakes. Yeah, the nutty cakes is kind of this Anuruddha story. Yeah? And the nutty cakes is a story. Nutty means there isn't. That's what it means in Pali. So he always got, he went to his mom when he was a child, he always got cakes. There was always cakes available. He was spoiled, basically. So they always go, okay, here's another cake for you, okay. But one day, there wasn't any cakes. So his mom said, oh, nutty cake, nutty cakes. Oh, yeah, please, nutty cakes. I'll take those. No, it means there is no cakes. <laughs> but he was so spoiled, he didn't understand the word there isn't. That was kind of completely alien to him. So he thought that was there isn't. It's a kind of cake that there isn't cake. <laughs> so that's kind of the background, just to tell how kind of how he had been brought up in the kind of most ridiculous way, basically. So he said, No, I can't go forth, you go forth. And then Mahanama says to him, Well, in that case, I will have to tell you all the duties of the household life. And he says, okay, let us hear the duties of the household life. And he says, well, you know, it starts in kind of in the spring and you have to start tilling the fields. Yeah? And when you have tilled the fields, you have to uh, put, you know, get all the rocks out of the field. When you get the rocks out, you kind of have to put all the seeds in. And after you put all the seeds in, you have to irrigate the field. Yeah? You kind of dig all this, right, get a river in the right direction. Right? After irrigating the field, you have to drain the field. After draining the fields, you have to weed the fields. Yeah? And after weeding the fields, when the crop is ripe, you have to, uh, you have to um, uh, cut the crops or reap the, whatever it's called, reap the crops or whatever it's called. Uh, and then you have to thrash them to get the seeds out. And after thrashing them, you have to winnow it. So all the kind of the chaff and all this, you know, bad stuff go, goes away with the wind. And then you have to put it into storage, right? And as soon as you have kind of put it into storage and it's safe, the next season begins. And Anura says, what? <laughs> 
And then Mahanama says, and our fathers and grandfathers, yeah, they did this all the while, and while they were in the middle of doing all this work, they died in the middle of that work, right? And then the next generation had to take over, and then they died, and now we are here. And Anaruda says, in that case, I will go forth, you stay in the home. <laughs> That's a very kind of amusing story. And, and so Mahanama, he uh, ended up being the householder, right? He took that on. I don't know how he was. He was very patient with his brother. I have to admit, pretty impressive character, yeah? Whatever Anuruddha would do, he would just go along with it. Uh, so uh, anyway, so this is Mahanama. And he is here, and he comes to the Buddha. And he, uh, as a good uh, Buddhist disciple, he asks him questions about the Dhamma specifically. So this is this encounter here. <coughs> And so this is how it goes. At one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the Sakyans, near Kapilavattu in the Banyan Tree Monastery. Banyan Tree Nigroda, Nigroda Rama Monastery. Yeah. And these are the large fig trees you find in India, the Banyan trees. They yeah, very beautiful trees. Yeah. And the Bodhi tree is also very closely related to the Banyan, Banyan Tree. Yeah. Then Mahanama the Sakyan went up to the Buddha bowed, sat down to one side, and said to him, Sir, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions, what kind of meditation do they frequently practice? Yeah, so here you have a noble disciple, Arya Savaka, and a noble disciple Sometimes it means someone who is a stream enterer or someone who is a noble person, but not always. It can also mean good people in general, right, who practice in the path properly. But in this case, it seems to mean a stream enterer because it specifically says here, who has reached the fruit, right? Reaching the fruit means the fruit of stream entry. Who has understood the instruction basically means un really understood it fully. That's what it means. Uh, so here he seems to be saying, well, I'm a stream enterer. What kind of meditation should I be doing if I'm a stream enterer? And um, it's easy to think, well, in that case, it hasn't got anything to do with anyone who is not a stream enterer, but that is not really quite right. Yeah? But the point here is that if you are a stream enterer, then these kind of reflections aren't easy for you because you know who the Buddha is. You know what the Dhamma is. And so you can just lean your mind in that direction and you feel joy automatically there. Yeah? Because you know what these things are. You know this is about the highest happiness in the world. You know this is the meaning of life. Yeah? So it's very easy to lean your mind towards those things. Yeah? So for those who are not stream enterers, yeah, we need to put in a bit more work. That's the only difference. Yeah? But of course, we should be doing the same things. Yeah? So uh, just to kind of get that out of the way. So he was a very inspiring person, Mahanama, because of his uh, profound insight into the Dhamma. And then the Buddha replies, Mahanama, when a noble disciple has reached the fruit and understood the instructions, they frequently practice this kind of meditation. So here comes the first kind of meditation, yeah, or the first kind of reflection that you should be doing. Yeah. Uh, in this particular case. Uh, and um, this, so the, here we go. Firstly, a noble disciple recollects the realized one. The realized one is the Buddha. That blessed one is perfected, uh, a fully awakened Buddha, accomplished in knowledge and conduct, holy, knower of the world, uh, supreme guide for those who wish to train, uh, teacher of gods and humans, uh, awakened and blessed. I'll just read the whole paragraph just to kind of and go back to the beginning again. When a noble disciple recollects the realized one, their mind is not full of greed, hate and delusion. At that time their mind is unswerving, based on the realized one. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching and finds joy connected with the teaching. When they are joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they are blissful, the mind becomes immersed in stillness. The mind becomes still, if you like. 
This is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced and lives untroubled among people who are untroubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and they develop the recollection of the Buddha, the Buddha Nusati, Buddha Nusati. Yeah, so this is how to recall the Buddha. This is how it is always mentioned in the suttas. This is how you do it. This is this very famous verse that many of you will have heard. Itipiso Bhagava Arahang Samma Sambuddho Vijja Charana Sampanno, etc. Right? That is the that very famous verse. And often we chant it. Yeah? Buddhists around the world chant this verse all the time. And sometimes they know what it means, sometimes they don't. And uh, sometimes, even if they know what it means, they haven't really reflected deeply what this is about. And the more deeply you reflect on this, uh, the more powerful it becomes, because you start to really feel like you are a disciple of the Buddha. So, uh, so let's just start from the beginning, yeah? and then we can talk a little bit about this. And so I would talk, uh, not kind of so much on each individual of these uh, Qualities. These are called the Buddha Guna in the commentaries. The Guna means the quality. Buddha is, of course, the Buddha. And uh, there are how many Buddha Gunas? I'm not sure, 10 or 11 or something like that. But anyway, whatever it is. Uh, so it starts off by saying the Blessed One is perfected. Uh, yeah? He's an Arahant. Uh, this is kind of the starting point here. Uh, and uh, so this word Arahant means someone who is worthy. Uh, that's kind of the root meaning of that word. It was used in ancient India for any kind of spiritual guru or teacher who was considered special. They were called arahants. Uh, and then the Buddha, of course, as he often does, he takes the vocabulary of the day, reinterprets it, gives it a new meaning, and gives it a Buddhist kind of meaning. Uh, and so in Buddhism, it means, has a very specific meaning, someone who has reached the end of the Buddhist path. Uh, so perfected in Buddhism means someone who has eliminated all the defilements of the mind. Uh, defilements are completely gone. They have been destroyed. The anusyas, the underlying tendencies, have been uprooted. Uh, and uh, that means that they can no longer arise. In that sense, you are perfected, uh, right? Uh, so if someone gets angry, uh, they are not an arahant. It's kind of useful to know. If they are greedy, they're not an arahant. Uh, if they are not kind, they're likely not to be an arahant. Uh, if they are confused, uh, they would not be an arahant. So it kind of gives you some ideas of, of who is awakened in this world. <coughs> but I like this idea of being worthy. Yeah, you are a worthy person. It's a beautiful idea. What are you worthy of? And elsewhere it talks about what you're worthy of. You're worthy of hospitality, you're worthy of support, you're worthy of all these kind of things. And you know what it's like if you have a good teacher in school, you may feel that that teacher is worthy of something, yeah? Worthy of a teacher's salary, worthy, maybe you give your teacher a gift, or maybe you have a gratitude for teacher because they have done something good for you. Uh, they've taught you skills yeah, that you need to function in this world. Uh, so you have a gratitude to a good teacher in life. Uh, but the ordinary teacher is nothing compared to the Buddha. Uh, the ordinary teacher gives you access to livelihood. The ordinary teacher gives you access to being able to make sense of the world and function in the world. Uh, the Buddha gives you access to the highest happiness. Uh, the Buddha gives you access to the meaning of life. That is the real teacher. So if an ordinary teacher is worthy of respect, worthy of some degree of support, the Buddha is really worthy of support because he gives you the highest. And what you give him in return is only small stuff compared to what he gives you. So this is the idea of someone who is really worthy, yeah? worthy of your respect, worthy of your kindness, worthy of your generosity, hospitality. And uh, this is what wonderful way of thinking about the Buddha. Huh? So when you bow down to a Buddha statue, you bow down to the Buddha, basically you're respecting the Buddha because of uh, who he is, uh, those qualities, uh, your teacher, someone who gives you access to the greatest thing that anyone can give, give to anyone else. Uh. Buddha is the greatest teacher in the world. Uh. This is kind of the point here. Uh. And so he becomes worthy, uh, worthy of whatever it is that we will support him in whatever way we want to support him. So this is the idea of perfected, and you are worthy. You are a fully awakened Buddha, right? Um, you are, uh, this basically means 
This is the Samma Sambuddha. This is the Buddha that actually teaches in the world. You are a teacher uh, of everyone. Uh, Samma Sambuddha is fully awakened and you are a teacher. It's kind of opposed to Pacheka Buddhas and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't mean you are fully awakened. Uh, you are accomplished in knowledge and conduct. Uh, yeah. Um, what kind of knowledge are you accomplished in? Uh, and uh, the, obvious, the obvious knowledge that you are accomplished in is the three higher knowledges of Buddhism. Uh, yeah, the knowledge of uh, past lives, of Kamma, and of Arahantship, of full awakening. Yeah. These are the kind of three knowledges uh, that you have. Uh, and uh, what are those knowledges? Well, what they really are, what they come down to, is an understanding of happiness and suffering. Yeah. Yeah, happiness and suffering is the one thing that drives us as human beings. Uh, when you look at the sequence of dependent origination, I don't know if you, some of you may know it, some of you probably don't know it, uh, it's a sequence of 12 factors, one leading to the next one. Uh, and one of the important uh, links in there, that links two of these factors, is feeling gives rise to craving, to desire. Uh, because we feel the world, uh, we have desires. Uh, if there was no feeling, you wouldn't be able to desire anything yet. Yeah? So feeling, in a sense, is this pivotal thing in our lives that drives us to do anything. Yeah? When you choose anything, when you do anything, it's always based on feeling in one way or another. Yeah? Without feeling, we wouldn't do anything. Yeah? Then life would be utterly pointless without feelings. Yeah? Feelings is this kind of critical thing that motivates us in, in life. So the Buddha has this full understanding of this particular thing of happiness and suffering, yeah? understanding this link between feeling and craving, yeah? and how to, uh, what these things are, how to maximize the happiness, reduce the pain, and how ultimately to go to a, a point where all you have, you have, have eliminated all, all problems. That is kind of the Buddha's uh, wisdom, what it really is about. Wisdom is that wisdom of happiness and suffering, yeah? Yeah? understanding where they are to be found, uh, understanding what practice leads to these things. That is the real insight of the Buddha. It's actually very practical. Huh? Sometimes when we talk about too much about the Four Noble Truths and these kind of things, it can be hard to really pinpoint what is going on. Huh? But that real right view, that real wisdom, is really just understanding happiness and suffering. That's really all it is. Huh? And once you get that, you think, yes, this is exactly what I'm after. Huh? Yeah, of course it is, because this is what we're all after, as long as you interpret happiness in the right way. It doesn't mean some kind of superficial euphoria. It means like real deep sense of happiness, satisfaction, contentment, meaning of life, all of that kind of thing. That's what it really is referring to. So the Buddha has this insight into the human condition. That's what it really means. He understands what it means to be human. He, had, he was human himself. Now he has understood his own condition, and of course he knows that it applies to everyone else. This is the power of the Buddha. But uh, the Buddha has something else. One thing is that insight. But the Buddha has another very important quality. And that is, of course, compassion. Yeah, if you look at the life of the Buddha, it is often said that the Buddha to be, he decided to kind of practice the path out of compassion. But actually, that is, there isn't really any evidence for that. Yeah? The evidence in the suttas is that he decided to practice the path because of suffering in his own life. And then when he found a solution to his own suffering by becoming enlightened or awakened, then compassion arose. Because it makes sense, first of all, you had to find a solution. How can you have compassion first? Kind of a bit backwards, the normal way the story of the Buddha is taught. Then you have compassion. Yeah? And then you have this famous story of Brahma Sahampati coming down to the Buddha and saying, please teach. Yeah? There are people wasting away in the world who are suffering, and if you don't teach, they're gonna, you know, it's going to be bad for them. Yeah? There will be people in Derbyshire in the year 2023 who want to hear your teachings. And what's going to happen to them if you don't teach these teachings? And so uh, he comes down and begs the Buddha to teach. Yeah? And that awakens the compassion in the Buddha. And then the Buddha thinks about who he should teach. And then he starts his teaching career. But the Buddha was reluctant before that. Why was he reluctant? And the reason why he was reluctant was because he realized it's going to be a hassle to teach. It's going to be painful. There will be people in the world who will reject his teaching, who will argue with him, who will create all kinds of problems. 
And the Buddha is perfectly happy just to sit in a cave somewhere and meditate, right? He would rather do that because that actually is real happiness for the Buddha. And he would rather not have to deal with all these people in the world. And so when the Buddha teaches you, he has no vested interest. He is not teaching you because he wants things from you. He's not teaching you because he wants disciples. He doesn't want fame. In fact, for the Buddha, fame is just problematic. Yeah, it creates more problems. He calls it the dung happiness elsewhere in the Sutta as fame. Milha Sukha is what he calls fame. So all of these ordinary happiness of the world, the Buddha become sufferings because they stop him, they block him from actually experiencing the higher happinesses, like the jhanas, like and all these kind of things. So he has no vested interest apart from compassion. In fact, he has a negative vested interest. He would rather not do it, but he does it because of compassion and because he knows that he has the answer that everyone in the world is looking for. And that is very interesting here. And uh, <laughs> I'm going a little bit over time now, so uh, give me another couple of minutes just to kind of finish off my train of thought, otherwise we're going to be stopped in the middle of something here, which is very, to me very interesting here. Because if someone has a negative vested interest, they'd rather not do it, it means that when they teach, it is very pure. There is no ulterior motives at all. In fact, there is only compassion driving him, compassion and insight and understanding. And when there is no ulterior motives, you know that the Buddha will not say things just to get your attention. He will not say things to kind of please you. He's not a crowd pleaser, right? Or anything like that. He says things simply to help you out because he has compassion for you. What that means is when you read the suttas, when you listen to the word of the Buddha, yeah, you actually read it in a different way. This is someone who really has your best interest at heart. That's the only way, only reason for him to teach. And when someone, you know what it's like when you meet somebody in, in life and you feel that they are compassionate towards you, that they actually do have your best interest at heart. You really feel drawn, drawn to people like that. You want to listen to them because it feels like, yes, they really want to be kind to me. And this is exactly what's happening with the Buddha. There's this feeling of somebody here who has your real compassion. That's what they want to do. They want to be kind to you. So then you read the suttas in a new way. You read them carefully. Just like you listen to someone in this world who has compassion for you carefully in the same way you listen to the Buddha like that. And this is the way you get the most out of the suttas. Remember the compassion behind those words. Remember the wisdom behind those words. Here is someone trying, des trying the very best to help you. All the words that are in the suttas are there to help you out. None of it is superfluous. Nothing is missing. This is also found in the Pasadika Sutta, by the way. The Buddha specifically says that. Nothing superfluous, nothing missing. Everything is spoken out of compassion. So read the suttas with these kind of ideas in mind, and it opens them up. You read them with greater care. You read them taking more interest in what is there. You don't reject it so easily. You don't say, yeah, rebirth, yeah, who, you know, ancient superstition. You don't think like that anymore. You think, wow, if the Buddha says it, I can't really believe it, but at least let me have an open mind about these things. That is how you start to think when you see these things in this particular way. So my point here is just to open up, yeah, open up a sense of connection to the Buddha. This is just the beginning. I'll talk much more about this because this is, a, to me, a very important area. And uh, getting a feeling, the human being, the Buddha who existed two and a half thousand years ago, a real human being, a real teacher, someone you can meet, someone you can see, someone you can ask questions of, but someone at the same time who has the most profound wisdom and the most profound compassion in the world. Anyway, let's stop there then. So... Uh, Keep on enjoying yourself and we'll see you back in at 7 o'clock.